you can go down there and you can motivate them. I didn't say you had to eat them. I just said you could go snorkel and see them. Exactly. Uh, I'm, if I'm down there, I'm like, be free, be happy. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you, Joel? Oh, I'm so fantastic. How, how do I pronounce your name? Archana. Archana? Yep. See, I added all sorts of additional letters in my head. I was like, Archana. And I was like, nope, nope, that's not right. Archana. Yeah. It's uh, phonetically, if you, if you use you, mm-hmm. like Archana, you'll probably get it right. <laughs> there we go. I'm always learning. I get to meet some of the most interesting people with the best names everywhere. So I love it. <laughs> So where are you calling in from today? I'm in Mountain View. Okay. Is it, yeah. is it nice out there? Is it beautiful uh, weather? It, the weather can't quite make up its mind today. It started out <laughs> sunny and we got a lot of rain. Everything is all wet and squelchy outside and now it's sunny again. So we'll oh. <laughs> that's, that's how it is in Florida in the summers. It's like it'll rain for like 20 minutes twice a day. You're out of Florida? Yeah, we're out of Florida. Yeah. Have you been down this way much? Um, yeah, to Miami, uh, mostly. Prop- and actually, we went down to the Keys. That was an excellent. Yeah, thing. love the you Keys. Get a lot of lobster. You can like snorkel and find lobster and all yeah. sorts of cool stuff. That's right. Only issue is I'm vegetarian, so. Well, I, you can I, find I, them I to hang out with them. To run free. <laughs> you, you can go down there and you can motivate them. I yeah. didn't say you had to eat them. I just said you could go snorkel and see them. Exactly. Uh, I'm, if I'm down there, I'm like, be free, be happy, <laughs> swim away. <laughs> there you go. We'll go down there with megaphones. Uh, <laughs> so, by the way, this is the podcast. Like we just record the whole time. It's just you and I hanging out, being a little nerdy, talking about technology and life and stuff. Is that okay? Sounds great. I, I saw that you know Sheila Jordan. Have you read I, this? I do. And I have the book. She's Sheila's been my mentor for many years. Um, I worked for her at Cisco. Um, uh, she was my boss at uh, Symantec uh, when mm-hmm. I went there. Um, yeah, uh, she's, she's great. She's incredibly sharp and articulate. Like when I started talking with her, I was like, whoa, she's amazing. Yep, yep. Just, just has a, an amazing vision for her team um, and uh, for IT. Yeah, and then she was kind enough because uh, I, have, I have a wife and two kids and she sent me a book. And so I have the book, I gave it to my wife and she loved it. <laughs> and so I've like plugged the book a bunch and yeah, I was like, anything I can do to help Sheila, <laughs> like just let me know. Yeah, that's great. So I'm, I'm really excited to be talking to you. I was just talking last week to the CTO, Shri, right? Yes. And Shri- Yep, go ahead. It's fantastic. Um, he's, he's been at last year longer than I have. Uh, when I joined last year, he's, he works out of the Mountain View office as well. So when I joined last year, he was my buddy and, uh, you know, really helped me navigate at last year as I came in new from the outside. So one of the conversations that comes up a lot is every company has a different way that they have their CIO, CTO set up. So could you tell me a little bit about how that looks at Atlassian? Yeah, I, you know, Shri and I, we look at it uh, pretty fluidly. Um, it depends on, um, you know, what we're looking to do. Are we building things? Are we running things? Um, and uh, you're right. I think in different companies, um, it's structured differently. And we talk very openly about what should sit where, um, what skill sets are suited to what, uh, what part of the business and, um, you know, where there is growth for teams. Um, sometimes having just one or two people in one organization means that you don't have really have a team. You don't really have much of a line of sight to your growth. So having the right teams um, sit in the right places um, within the organization um, and doing the right thing for their career growth is, uh, is important. Um, so we do revisit um, some of, you know, where's infrastructure, where, who manages AWS, who's doing commerce, um, you know, some of those uh, areas where we have intersection, um, but we work it out and uh, do the right thing for Atlassian and for our teams. That's I love it. And the culture over there, when, when I was talking with them, the, one of my favorite uh, culture items was open company, no bullshit. Like I, I loved that. And it's, I, it seems as I, as I read through your website and the other culture items too, I was like, whoa, you guys have a really strong, strong community. 
We do, um, and we're big on running open. Um, that's what attracted me to Atlassian. Um, you know, when I talk to the leadership and I, um, it's, it's not just words on a piece of paper or on a website. We actually embody it. We live it every day. Um, and that was the most exciting um, thing for me coming into um, Atlassian. And I've loved every minute um, that I've been here. Um, the team really believes in open and we live it every day. We learn from it. Um, it it's open, balanced, very outcome focused. Um, and doing the right thing is, is, is a big deal, right? So um, I love, love all parts of that. So I know where you are today, right, at Atlassian, but I want to step it like all the way back. What, what was the beginning of your experience with technology? Like when you were, were you young? Were you in college? Like when did you first inter start interacting with tech? So uh, growing up in India um, as um, a young girl, um, I uh, did most of my um, middle school and beyond schooling at, um, at my grandparents. Um, they had better schools where my grandparents were. And uh, I remember uh, <laughs> my grandmother would start fretting any time my um, dad or uncle were to visit. Uh, both were electrical engineers. <laughs> and, you know, they loved fixing broken things or attempting to fix broken things. And, and my grandma would be in a, in a tizzy trying to get it fixed before they came, on, uh, came over because her, her contention was, if your dad or your uncle gets your hand on this, it can never be fixed ever again. <laughs> <laughs> so she would joke about it, but sometimes she wouldn't be able to make it to the repair shop before my dad or uncle arrived. And that was the most fun part for me because we would open it up. We would open up radios and clocks and, and the parts would be all laid out. And we were trying to find that one offending part um, and, 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 you know, get it fixed or, you know, change it out so that we could make the radio work again. And it was super exciting for me. And both my dad and uncle were really patient. So as they were laying it out, they would explain to me what each part did. And, you know, I, I got incredibly curious about it. And I used to go around telling everybody that I would be an engineer, or an electrical engineer when I grow up. Um, and I did. <laughs> so I did follow that path. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I love uh, technology because of what it solves but also because, you know, you really have the opportunity to fix things. Um, and uh, that was, that's where it started and it's kind of held up, I guess. So then from there, you have a deep interest in it from, from a younger age because your parents and family were involved with it. And then you, was that like what you had your, your eyes set on for college? Yeah, so I, I um, you know, growing up in India, engineering was not a back then especially it wasn't quite the logical career path um i had many people in my family that tried to change my mind to it's like maybe you should become a doctor instead and i said no i would be an engineer and i did uh pick up math you know um a lot of the stem subjects and uh it was hard uh but it was fun because every time that that challenge and the bar getting higher was to me, you know, something that I wanted to uh, go after. Um, so I did go to engineering school um, as um, an elect uh, electrical engineer, did my master's as an electrical engineer, um, and started working here in Cisco um, as a hardware engineer, for, and then became a chip designer, <laughs> so kind of, and then moved to software. So it's been, um, you know, I was a uh, engineer by trade, and I worked in product development uh, in the early part of my career. And so, so now that you're at Alasian, and we were talking about culture, and it's distributed, so you've you've traveled quite a bit around the world. The company is based around the world. I think it started in Sydney, right? Yep. Yep. Perfect. And and so how how do you because because you're into culture and I read some of your interviews online about diversity and culture and inclusion how, how do you do that on a macro like when you're all the way up at CIO of, of such a large organization how do you ensure that all the different areas all over the world uh, have that culture how do you scale the culture um, you know this isn't something that there's a magic bullet for every company that I've been in is a little different, right? Um, in how we operate, um, specifically Atlassian, um, 
our, it was Atlassian was started in Sydney. Our founders are based out of Sydney. Um, many of our business function leaders are in San Francisco. Shri and I, uh, CTO, CIO, we sit here in Mountain View. Um, we have a team in Austin, a team in Manila, and just stood up a new team in Bengaluru. Um, so you can imagine just that global um, team. Uh, one thing that I'm really I feel lucky to inherit is um, that every t every meeting we do is video. We are very comfortable as a company with video. Um, we're also beginning to tread some new ground on um, understanding remote work and you know understanding what makes it really work. If you have eight people in a room, you have one person remote. That's not a very effective meeting. But if you have everybody remote, you can actually have a much more um, you know, inclusive meeting where everybody has a voice and, and uh, feels very comfortable uh, speaking up. So that's, um, as we look at those kind of learnings, we're trying to adapt our meetings to make sure that um, there is that open, inclusive feel to these meetings um, where people are encouraged to uh, voice their opinions. And just because you're the, that one person that's remote and in Manila and the rest everybody's in Sydney, you really don't have the voice. So um, I wouldn't say we've figured it all out, uh, but we are trying and experimenting our way into making sure that um, that inclusiveness is, is kind of part of everything we do, uh, part of how we collaborate. Um, you know, Atlassians, our mission is to unleash the potential of a team. Um, so if you think about that and you say today, teams are distributed. They're not centralized, they're not in one location, they're distributed, they might be remote, they might be in other locations. You have to bring teams together to get their best work done. Um, so how do you make that efficient and how do you use our, you know, our open culture, our processes in place, and of course our technology to enable it? No, I love it. Like those are this is why this is why I love having experts like you come on and share with what you're experiencing and what you're learning as as you're growing these large companies. One of your quotes that I that I read was that you um, you're very passionate about talent management and you intentionally make space to invest time and energy in your people. And so one of the things people always ask me, maybe they're trying to level up, make a transition from individual contributor to team lead or from team lead to director, is what sort of habits, what traits. Um, do you value, do you look at and say, hey, when I see a person doing these things, I know to invest my time and energy into them? Yeah, um, you know, I believe that different people bring different skills and strengths to the table. Um, it isn't, um, you know, I, I, my team, uh, my staff, um, and people that I mentor and coach that have reached out to me and said, hey, I like this attribute in you. Can you work with me to figure this out? It isn't that, you know, everything that I do is, is something they're looking to emulate. Maybe there's one or two things um, that, um, you know, they appreciate or admire. It's, it's the same in the talent that I'm looking for. Um, though one thing that I think is, um, can be a big differentiator in today's world is the curiosity factor, right? Um, people talk about IQ and EQ. Um, I add CQ to that, the curiosity coaches, right? I love so, it. I think it's really important in today's world, if you think about how rapidly technology is changing, how rapidly companies are changing, um, the ability to actually um, leverage um, and have that openness and that curiosity is what I think differentiates that acceleration of career growth um, uh, within, within um, uh, for individuals. So, I'm a big believer in that, um, and I do look for that. Uh, you don't have to know everything, but if you're curious, you will have that passion to learn and absorb, um, and you will have plenty of exposure in companies like Alasian, where we have tremendous growth, um, and we're investing in our people and new technology and, and new capabilities for the company. There's, the opportunity is there, but if you're curious, you're going to embrace it and, and really accelerate your career growth. I love that. You win the original. I've never heard that before. And I'm a huge fan because like I've heard be curious, but the, when you call it CQ, like you win. I love it. That's my favorite conversation of today because it probably comes, I'm, I'm an incredibly curious individual. And so I'm always looking and exploring new things. Um, and then I always like to, to figure out like who else has seen it. One thing that 
that makes me think of you because um, we were just talking about growing your teams and, and looking at how you can get them to work well together. And something that's come up recently for me is I've seen a series of these tools and I don't even know how to classify them. So maybe you can help me with that. But essentially what they are is they plug into like your Jira's and all of, and like your GitHub's and they plug into all these different types of tools. And then they give you these analytics on your people and like how they work together and they give you some insights. Have you seen some of these tools? Yeah. Um, you know, so to me that comes stems from that hunger for data, right? Um, almost every company that is successful um, in transforming and being able to be uh, to, to drive a level of customer loyalty is doing it through data and how you mine and leverage data within the organization. Um, so how you build something, how you uh, collaborate, how you're able to interact with your customers. If you have rich data that you can leverage and you know, tie it to analytics and dashboards and kind of have a continuous view of what's happening in your business, you can react much more faster than if you don't know. If, if you're going to wait two, three years to find out get the feedback from your customer and go, oh, I should have done this, this, and that. But if you have data at your fingertips and you're able to react rapidly to that, um, and we do that through personalization and experimentation. And um, so we do have tools and technology that plug into the systems that we use. Um, and more and more, it's about not just that reactive analytics, but the predictive analytics. So you have data mm. as, as, as things are happening and you're able to respond to them in almost real, near real time, which is what's super exciting about um, you know, some of the technology plays that we see out there in the market. Um, and as Atlassian, um, what we've, we've done a couple of things. We wanna make sure that our data, the baseline, right? Our data lake, the data is it's solid and complete and it's trusted by everybody. Once you kind of have that, you can build a lot on top of it. You could build AI ML capabilities, you could build a data science capabilities, you could automate things, you could get bots into the system so that, you know, we love bots. People, yeah. throwing people and throwing people at it, right? It takes longer, whereas technology can can do what humans can do in you know, much, short, much shorter time. So how do you leverage the right balance of technology with cognition um, is, is a very interesting space. And I'm really excited about it. I, again, we, I wouldn't say we've cracked it, um, and the, about some of the new technology and tools that are coming out in the marketplace that drive that, what you talked about yeah. analytics, I think is fascinating. Have, have you seen it? Here's what I'm actually trying to get to the bottom of. I'm trying to figure out, is it a category yet? Because I've seen a couple. The one that stood out to me the most was called Penpoint. I don't know if you've heard of them or not. But no? All right. Yeah. So it's called Penpoint. And, you know, I'm always, because people always send me stuff from the show, they're like, oh, have you seen this? Have you seen this? This is really cool. So I'm always looking at new products all the time. And then recently I saw Penpoint and like two or three other companies come out that were like really similar to them. And I haven't like dove deep into them yet. Like, you know, you see the sales website and you're like, okay, I kind of see what you kind of do. <laughs> but I actually yeah. have a demo with them later this week because, because I saw it emerging as a category and then I couldn't figure out what's the name for this category. So that's, that's the mission I'm on personally is what is the name of this category of these new tools that are going to plug into like everything you do and then give you insights on your people working. So if you come across an answer for that, please follow back up with me. <laughs> I'll be sure to. To me, I still think of it as um, tools and systems that help drive better decision making, right? And if you look at the last couple of decades, the category names for this thing has evolved. Um, what, what has changed, though, is the technology has leapfrogged, right? And, and the pace at which you can now get access to this is like doubled and tripled over the last decade, right? So that's, that's what's causing uh, even, even robotics process automation. I mean, for, for decades, we've been talking about process automation, but what technology can do today and how rapidly that has evolved is, is beginning to create these new categories, I think. Yeah. And then, then it's up to people like me to figure out like, what are we going to name them? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
And then, so here's what I'll do. I'm going to actually, I have like a demo scheduled because I want to go in like deep and see what it is. Um, and then if I find anything interesting from it, I'm going to kick it off to you so you can, we can figure out if this is like an emerging trend or if this is just something that like it already exists, marketing just rebranded it as something else. Right. Cause, yeah. Cause that's what that's, I'm always interested in. About it. Yeah. <laughs> I just like, I like to get to the bottom. I, I'm super nerdy, so I like to figure out things. Um, there goes, we love nerdy in Alaska. We're right? full of, of nerdy people in Alaska. I feel at <laughs> I home. I yeah. pride in it. <laughs> right? Shri yeah. said you guys had some uh, like developer conferences coming up in the next couple of months. So I might pop out there and say hi for then because like, I feel at home with all, with all the people. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, in last year, we do quarterly hackathons. We have innovation days. We have, um, you know, tech teams getting together. Um, so it's it's um, culture and we're very engineering heavy culture. And it's yes. fun, actually. <laughs> yeah, I grew up, my, my father was an engineer as well. And so he, he taught me, he would do freelancing. So he'd give me these little projects to work on to keep yeah. me busy while he could yeah. do actual work, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Love those little side projects because, you know, the, the fun is when they really turn into something that right? you go, oh my God, I had an aha moment and this could actually become bigger than what we thought it could be. So that's the right. Exciting. I think Shri said that they uh, shipped like over a hundred things from the hackathons, like into their actual base product. Like that's absolutely. unbelievable. That's so cool. Yeah, I think yeah. It, it, is, it is really cool. Um, many of our projects have, and products have started from these. So it's exciting. So I'd like you to sort of paint a picture of what does an average day look like for you? Oh, wow. Um, it is. So when I look back on, you know, my engineering days to my days in um, IT, um, it is very much around people and communication and strategy, um, helping figure out kind of, you know, what is strategically where are we heading as an IT organization within Atlassian versus Atlassian heading, how do we align to um, kind of the problem set that we through technology can help solve. Um, so my day is um, very heavy on both strategy as well as business um, leadership interactions. In fact, I, I color code my calendar so that I can kind of <laughs> assess, am I spending enough time outside with my customers and stakeholders um because it's it's very easy to get pulled into the day-to-day -day and you could you know spend 70 80 percent of your time within it because we're, we're looking at technology we're building teams we're, we're solving problems we're doing projects so how do you kind of balance that and make sure I'm spending enough time with my customers and stakeholders and listening because um, it's really important to understand the business strategy because IT's number one job is to make sure that you're driving business outcomes for the company. And yes. so for me, it's, it's, you know, we could have a lot of output, but if we're not driving enough business outcome, then we're, we're not doing a job. So I take that really seriously. I've spent a lot of time talking to our business stakeholders and listening. Um, and, um, I think that's that's kind of the number one um, thing I'm beginning to also, like we are using all of our own technology within IT. So, you know, drinking our own champagne. Um, and, that's, better, uh, that's better than dog food. <laughs> I think so, I think so. Way classier, you win. <laughs> right, so drink our own champagne. I, I, I really think, um, you know, I'm beginning to allocate some amount of time to that where we're beginning to look at how can we, Alas and IT, um, you know, talk about how we run open? What are the, uh, you know, Atlassian uh, plays that we use? Um, how do we do health monitors to make sure our teams are healthy, working on the right things, growing? Um, how do we make sure we're pay paying the right attention to talent? Um, so that is um, another big po uh, part of, um, you know, what my time is um, invested in. And then, of course, there is the usual, uh, you know, let's, let's make sure we are operationally strong. Let's make sure we're, um, you know, bringing in strong talent. And uh, I spent a lot of time with my staff and um, in mentoring talent within, uh, within my team as well as in the rest of the company. Now, that's, first of all, I, you, you're awesome. <laughs> so you're just exploding my notes here. Like, I'm just non-stop writing them color coding your calendar right yeah <laughs> how, how how do you do that like do you use google calendar 
I do. We use we use Google Suites. Um, you know everything. Email calendar. So, um, so do you have three separate calendars, or does it let you color code your events? So I just color my meetings differently. Yeah. So if I look at my week um, or month, and it's all red. Um, red is, um, all, all, you know, all of the internal uh, meetings, projects, uh, my one-on-ones with my staff and, um, you know, the coaching mentoring of internal teams. The green is business stakeholder meetings. So I look at it to see the balance. Is, is it all green? Is it all red? And then there's the, you know, external engagements. Um, I color coded pink. Um, and I have, you know, <laughs> important, really yeah. important level important projects color coded red yellow so we kind of look at I, I look at my calendar that way and then I'm, I'm always shuffling it around a little bit going okay I'm spending way too much time in this area versus that area it's you know if it's if you see a sea of red then I'm probably not doing what I should be doing <laughs> so that's that's kind of how I look at it oh man you just taught me something new you're gonna laugh so hard because I have two different calendars. That's how I was separating them because then I could make oh, wow. a different calendars color. But I just went in real time and clicked on edit the event. I saw where you could actually change the color of the event. Right. I, I think it's on. a very handy thing to have. Very and, handy. Uh, you know, my, my um, EA, she's aware that, that that's how I'm looking at things. So right. she herself will color code it for me. So it's, uh, it's, it's very handy to at least have a good gut check on um, you know, am I allocating my time smartly um, to, yeah. to help drive the outcome that I want? Um, my sales team will love it because we've been trying to figure out how to separate first appointments, second appointments, and third appointments because <laughs> you, you want to look at your calendar and you want to see them all and, and like it would be very useful to know what you're walking into, you know? Right. Yeah. Oh, you, you're, I feel like I owe you a consulting fee. <laughs> Google <laughs> Calendar <laughs> Consultant. <laughs> oh, this is great. So, so give me, give me some insights, some visualization on what does your direct report team look like? Um, I have a great staff. Um, they are, they, they have very diverse thinking. Um, and I have to tell you my half of my staff is new in the last year, like about 50% and 50% have been in the company two two to five years. Um, and that makes us great as well. But the diverse thinking that they bring to the table, everyone will come at a problem from a different angle. So you can imagine the, the, the norming, storming, forming <laughs> takes much longer. But I think we're so much richer for it because the decisions are well thought out. Like we're, 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 we come at it from different, different angles. So we, we, I feel we make better decisions. I feel we're driving better outcomes. Um, and I, I purposely want that, that, that healthy tension in my staff because it's, if everybody, if you put an idea out there and everybody says, yes, we should do it, um, then maybe we are, we're missing out, right? And, and I'd like to have the, the opposing point of view and have a debate and a discussion around it to make sure whatever we're out to do, whether it be with our customers, with our teams, um, for the business, let's make sure we're doing the right um, thing. So I, I, I do, I, I'm really proud of the fact that we have a team with very diverse thinking. Yes, yeah, so you've got some optimists, some healthy skepticists, like you have, oh, you've got yeah. a yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm probably the optimist. Um, <laughs> And I'll be I'll be putting you know things out there, and my team will look at me and go, "Where? Why do you think that's even possible?" And I'm like, "It is," because I believe it. You know, I'm, I'm a big glass um, half full kind of kind of person. And but the the people that are detail oriented and and um, you know much more of a, I don't think like you know they'll they'll put. Did you think about this? Did you think about that? Did you think about that? Those are the people that make us. Um, stronger, right? Because that balance, that counterbalance with me, um, to me is incredibly valuable. Well, and it's like how you can get the job done because we have this, like, I, I think I'm a lot like you in, in personality and optimist. And so what will happen is the the healthy skept, skepticist will start bringing, bringing things up. And sometimes it's just like we have fluid answers. Okay, well, if you had that, you could do this and you could do that. And you could, you could overcome <laughs> all these obstacles really quickly. And then, then they're like sold on it. They're like, whoa, you, you, you can overcome every objection like instantly. And, and then sometimes you can't, right? And then now you have to start questioning the idea and, and figuring out how much you know, you're going to drill down into it. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and it also helps us with, you know, we call, we look at decisions on, is this a one way or a two way? Like once we make this call, like, can you come back or you can't, right? Like if you have those one way decisions, especially you really want that thoroughness of thinking, you want the edge cases, you want to look at the negative effects um, as much, not just the, you know, happy path um, to, to the solve because the risk is higher because you can't, you can't go back. Um, so we do look at uh, decisions that way as well. And that's where that balanced team really, really helps. Yeah. It's like, I, I talked to somebody about decision-making and they were saying that the, your ability to change the sh- decision has direct proportion, to how much time you spend like making it. Right. It's so, like the decisions that are harder to change to come back from, I think you called it like a one-way decision takes more processing power pre-decision than something that's very easily reversible. Right. Absolutely. Uh, and we should take the time for it. Uh, in, in Atlassian, we have something called um, DACIs, which is like our, um, like we, we do everything in Confluence. Um, our intranet runs on Confluence, which is a product. Um, and we have these um, templates for decision making where you identify who are the people that need to be involved, who are the people that need to be consulted, who needs to be informed, who's the, who's the final, who makes the final call on this? And we frequently use language around, is this a, a, a two-way door or one-way um, door to, to make sure we're you know, at least landing on the right um, uh, decision. That that's why I love. I would love to work there, <laughs> engineering company, because you you engineer processes to help your people push more processes internally. Like you engineer your company to be easy to use from within your company, which yeah. um, you know what Peter Drucker, famous management author, talks about. As the company grows, its internal mass grows exponentially, which makes it you know go even slower. But you go inside an engineering company, and they engineered all these tools to to counteract that internal mass. Right. As we grow from, like, we started, um, you know, 15 years ago as, as a very small company. We've had tremendous growth over the last 15 years. Um, we're almost doubling um, every year, every two years. And to accommodate that growth, you have to be really smart at making sure, one, you got to make sure your values um, are, are um, you know, continue to be integral to the team because that's what drives that strong, open culture, the collaboration, the, the balanced view and the focus on outcomes that, that needs to be maintained as you grow from a hundred people company to a 3000 people company, which is what we are. Um, and for IT, this is really exciting because we play a big role in helping scale Atlassian. Um, we are, you know, that was one of the, I heard scale, like literally in every one of my interviews as I was talking to the leadership there. That's, that's something that we want to make sure we're really scaling and growing the company, but we preserve our values. We preserve the way we work and, um, you know, we're, we're building great products that our customers love. So that, that needs to be maintained through. Oh, I love it. So you just get, I I don't know. I don't even know what else to say. You say it so poetically and beautifully. I love it. (laughs) So, so what, what has been like growing pains, right? There, it's, there's always issues when you grow. So what are, what are some of the areas that, that weren't so easy that you had to, to put some more attention on to? Yeah. Um, I think you, you talked about it when you talked about tools and analytics and um, as you grow bigger, um, I think for IT, we're being asked to help scale the company. So we're looking at many transformations, like we're doing four to five large transformations um, for the company. Um, We're we're, we're, um, improving our processes. We're bringing in new technology to help um, help scale the business. We're transforming the way we're um, building products. We're transforming the way we're interacting with customers. Um, So the challenge has uh, been as you... Initially, when we were smaller, we would do, you know, projects that would involve smaller teams. Now we're trying to do these massive transformations. We're moving to the cloud in a, in a very big way. Um, it takes about a third of the company gets involved in it. And the ability to run those transformations, be successful in them, drive the right outcome, but also take everybody along and make sure everybody's voice is, um, is heard. Is That is a hard mix to get right um, for a company that uh, that is our size and uh, we're learning our way through it we're getting more structured 
where structure is required. Um, but getting better at, like everything doesn't have to be built like it is being built for the first time. We can reuse, we can reduce duplication. So we're, we're taking some learnings, making sure we're getting better at that rigor and structure where you know, some things don't need to be built from scratch. Some things can be leveraged and reused. So what, what is that? What some of those pieces are going to help make sure our capacity is reserved for the areas where we're really driving that high degree of creativity and innovation and driving value for our customers. So that's, um, that, that mix is shifting. And I think it needs a different set of skills sometimes to be able to do both, right? And do both well, uh, be operationally strong, but also continue to retain your creativity and innovation. Um, so that's the mix where we're still working through in IT. Um, we actually have started measuring our portfolio by that. What percentage of my time, because any, any new technology you put into the system, you're going to be, IT runs it, you build it, you run it, right? So what percentage of my time is being spent on running it and how can I, more and more of my talents time is spent on the new build the creative uh, work so that's that's a mix that as a company we're going to have to get right if we are going to kind of go through the next um, next phase of growth I love it now how, how do you leverage your network like let's say Sheila and I'm, I'm certain there's other people that are involved in your network that have, that have helped do throughout your career. So when you're working on these things, like these large transformations, do you, do you run ideas past them? Do you leverage them at all? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I've been really, really lucky. Um, in my entire career, I moved from product engineering to IT. I had many um, uh, female leaders um, that I reported to them, my direct managers, and Sheila was one of them. Um, I've definitely learned a lot from my mentors. Um, and most of my mentors have you know, I'm, I ask a lot of questions, talk about curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know anything about IT when I came into IT. Um, I was, a, you know, I, I understood product development. I didn't understand IT. Um, so I've learned a lot from my mentors who, who've, you know, taught me to always put the business outcomes ahead of technology. I mean, we take pride in being a technologist and we're always going to stay at, at the cutting edge of it. But if you're going to be successful as an IT leader, you have to put business outcomes ahead um, of you know, any, any technology changes that you might do. In fact, um, my first job in IT, my first quarter end, um, that lesson actually <laughs> really went home for me for, from one of my mentors. Um, uh, this uh, mentor was a business leader and her, her responsibility was closing the quarter. And the IT team, my team, was responsible for you know, all of the processes that would help close the quarter. And I remember uh, we ran into a big issue. Um, it was orders were getting stuck and we had four hours to close the quarter. And I remember getting her on the phone and I will never forget her, her question wasn't, you know, how we can solve the problem. Her question was, what is the impact? And it turns out the impact of that issue was the orders that were stuck was a million dollars of impact in a $6 billion quarter. And her, her reaction, I'll never forget was do nothing. Don't put the quarter at risk. So from, as a technologist, our we were trying to solve it, right? We are like, order to stop, we can fix it, we can run a script, we can do this. And she was like, you can fix it after the quarter's over, we have four hours, do nothing. So sometimes the right thing to do is to do nothing. And I learned that from one of my mentors. It's, uh, it's everything that I've learned being an IT leader, um, you know, has been by, by kind of observing and uh, specifically asking, how would you do this? I have, I still am in connection um, with her and Sheila. Um, and I go, I'm, I'm, I'm noodling on this problem or I'm trying to drive this outcome. How would you do it? And then for me, it's not about doing exactly the way they would do it because I have to do it the way it works for me and my style with fitting within the company that I'm in. Uh, but understanding how they got to the outcome and being kind of, tying to that result rather than the path um, allows me to then think about, oh, this is doable, but here's how I would do it. And here are the steps, here's the approach I would take. Um, so I've been lucky to have mentors that have, you know, always guided me. I'm still in touch with them, meet them once a quarter, 
for coffee or dinner. Um, and um, I'm also part of a group. Um, we created a group. Uh, Sheila is part of that as well, a Bay Area CIO. So we meet, um, you know, once a quarter and just share what's going on in, in um, our companies and what kind of challenges we're looking at, what kind of technologies we're looking at. Um, so definitely take advantage of that. And, you know, I've been lucky to have great mentors. I'm, I'm also trying to pay it forward uh, by mentoring people uh, within the organization, people that have worked for me in the past from other companies, they're, they're in touch with me and yeah, we'll meet again once a quarter, twice a year, um, how, depending on how busy our schedules are. Um, I'm not the best at keeping in touch, but um, um, I do try and uh, you know make it work. But it's also uh, individual ownership on the mentees part of coming to you with a very clear thing that they need you to process. So like I found in leveraging my network for mentors, if I come to them and I'm like, eh, like ambiguous, or I don't have a very clear thing I need them to think through and come up with an outcome for, then I get not great results. But if I come to them and say, this is the situation, I've thought about it extensively, this is where I'm at, this is the, like you process this in front of me real quick. And these experts usually process it really fast right in front of you in real time. And then then you exactly. get that benefit of seeing how they how they come to their decision. And then you can do that two or three times within your network. And now you have a way better uh, position to make your decision. Uh, exactly. I always tell people, people ask me, how do you go about it? Like, how do you reach out? How do you keep the conversation going? How, how often do you meet? What What preparation do you do? And to me, it's like, you know, identify the two or three things that are in your mind that you're noodling on that are, are something if you solved would be a great win for you um, or for your team or your company, identify those things and make sure that that becomes the framing of that conversation. And if you frame it and you have, you'll, you'll have the right conversation and you'll get a lot of value out of it. If you go in completely unprepared, then you're probably not going to get much value out of that conversation. Yeah, like if I take you to lunch, I'm just like, mentor me. <laughs> It's like, yeah, exactly. It's like, what are you what are you talking about? We might so, just talk about the food. Right? Uh, right. So do you do any public speaking? Like do you do you go to events and conferences and talk? So I've just started that in Lassian. Um we are um in the midst of um a 10 city future of IT tour. Um just finished the New York one last week and I'm headed to Berlin and London. Um, this weekend um, to, to really talk about what a modern IT team looks like, how is the future of work changing, how do we adapt, how do we drive digital transformation. Um, and um, in Atlassian, what are we doing in IT to, um, it, you know, really that, you know, drinking our own champagne um, story. Um, so we're, we're uh, just started that. Um, I, I wouldn't say I've done many of these before this, this series, but I do intend to do more going forward, depending on my schedule and my color coded calendar. <laughs> yeah. Now, is this an Atlassian based event like internally or is this? Okay. Very cool. I like that you do that. Yeah. It's called the Atlassian Future of IT Tour. Um, and uh, we're, we're headed to 10 cities. Um, I'm going to five. Um, our president is going to um, a couple and um, uh, one of my staff is going to another three. That's awesome. Well, safe, safe travels. As, as we start to wrap up, I'd like to uh, present a hypothetical scenario to you. Okay. Because you're in Mountain View, let's say you're driving home, right? And at a red light, Elon Musk pulls up next to you, right? He's not taking his tunnel. He's just driving on top like a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> and and you two end up having this great conversation at the red light. You end up going back to his SpaceX facility to take a tour, and he's got a time machine there. And you go into the time machine, and you get to go back to yourself right when you're in college getting your mechanical or your electrical engineering degree, and you get to give yourself one piece of advice. What would that be? Don't underestimate the power of communication. Uh, when I was young, I, I just expected my work to speak for me. Um, and, I, you know, I, I look back at young Archana, 18 years old, and I go, why would you co-opt your voice? 
you know, you have the ability to communicate and advocate uh, for things. Why, why wouldn't you take advantage of it? And, you know, I've, I've uh, grown up <laughs> and learned that, that you never co-opt your voice, that you should always advocate for the work, the technology, the team, um, you know, the business, the, the right thing. You, you shouldn't just let someone else take it over or, or let your work just define it. Um, you should a um, absolutely take advantage of the fact that uh, you can communicate and, uh, you know, advocate for things you're passionate about. And so in, in this process of you becoming a great communicator, um, you leveraged books or how did you improve up your communication skills? Oh, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an exper experimental thing, <laughs> you know, it evolved over time. Um, I don't claim to be an amazing communicator. You um, are. I, I'll I, claim it for you. <laughs> thank you. I still think I have a lot of learning to do. Um, I, I love looking at um, stories and, and experiences and netting it out. I'm always looking at how would I say this if I could say it in a sentence? And it's really hard. Being crisp and clear is, is actually really hard. Uh, it, it's something that... Um, you have to practice, you have to ask for feedback. Um, a lot of times when I have these conversations or I'm doing a pitch, I'll ask whoever I'm presenting to say, did you get, what are the three things you got out of it? And sometimes it's completely opposite of the three things that I'm trying to get across. So it is, it is a bit of uh, learning. Um, I have read books. I, I admire um, great speakers. I listen to a lot of TED Talks. Yeah. Um, to just have that crisp, clear way of communicating something and getting it done in 18 minutes is uh, pretty darn amazing. Um, so there is still a lot of learning to do here. Oh, yeah. And, you know, for me, I find it I found it really interesting as I I started speaking. So I did the pot like I knew nobody like three years ago. I just been writing code for 17 years, like I was super yeah. quiet. And then I did the blog, which turned into the book and then the podcast. And then companies started asking me to come out and speak to their companies. Yep. So I started watching like TED Talks and uh, script writers. And here's one of my favorites, it's, um, Robert McKee. He, Storynomics, he's won like infinite awards for making movies and stories. And so I started, when I read that Storynomics book, I can never watch a movie the same again because mm -hmm. they, he describes like how every sentence is specifically built to support the story. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't directly support the current story or something happening in the future, the sentence doesn't exist. And so right. if you look at the next time you watch a movie after reading that book, it's like, it's not how humans talk at all. Like the script is very direct and clear and it's, it's almost weird, but um, yeah, telling, telling very articulate stories is super fascinating. And then there's Ted talks talks on how to give great TED talks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's no lack of resources. Storytelling is really important. I, I, I have learned that from, you know, I've been to a couple of classes where they talk about the storytelling and, you know, you listen to the Mark, I have a dream speech and you start breaking it down and, and look at kind of that impact of a speech like that. It's really about a story and how you tell that story, how you kind of build up the, the excitement, the energy, the cadence, and, and then get to a, here's what we are going to do about it. Uh, I think it's, it, that's what inspiring um, speakers do. And, um, you know, I admire that a lot. So communication, I think is, uh, we underestimate the power of it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. We, we made a podcast. Are you excited? <laughs> I am excited. I think this is, it's been fun. It's, uh, it's very easy to talk to you for sure, Joel. And uh, I appreciate you having me on this. Awesome. Well, right. thank you so much. And you have a fantastic day. Thanks for watching this interview. I hope it brought you a ton of value. If you liked it, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Tune in to the Modern CTO channel weekly for more amazing videos just like this one.